I hope you really pay attention to the words of these songs as we sing through them. I was looking through this last song, and I was realizing, you know, this is really the whole ideal human experience all the way through this song, summed up in, in five short verses. I mean, it starts off, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Oh, brethren, that is true. That is true. And that's one of the first things a man has to realize is just uh, what a friend Jesus Christ is for, for sinners. It goes on to say, Jesus, lover of my soul. I mean, what the Lord does for us, how much he loved us. And then, and then you go along, you find out a little bit more about him in verse 2. What a strength in weakness. How we need that on a daily basis. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing. He, my strength my victory wins. Amen. Jesus, what a help in sorrow, right? While the billows over me roll. Jesus, what a guide and keeper. And then at the, the final verse, Jesus, I do now receive him. You know, if a man or a woman were to go through that progress and realize those things about the Lord Jesus Christ and un come to understand those things and take those things and, and just hold on to them and cling to them when the storms are, are, are high, when the tempest is high, and he gets down to verse 5, Jesus, I do now receive him. Brethren, it doesn't get any better than that. Amen? Amen? There's some, uh, some thought that went into that song. Um, I appreciate, uh, again, just the opportunity to stand up once again on Sunday morning and preach. And if you will, open your Bibles very quickly to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 kind of sets the basis for what we're going to be talking about here this morning. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, very familiar passage of Scripture says this. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Let's bow our heads for just a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for an opportunity once again uh, to open the words of life, to, uh, to take a look at this book that you have uh, given us a true and a holy and a pure and a just and a perfect book, Father, that we can sit in our laps and open up and see what the words of God really are. And Father, where we have an opportunity for you to speak to us, I do pray that you would bless uh, this morning's uh, service. Lord, I know that uh, these, some of these things we're going to be talking about, each and every one of us have to navigate through at one point or another in life. And I just ask, Father, that you would set me aside, that you would let the words of your book and the examples that you've given us uh, in your book, uh, just kind of permeate our hearts. Father, maybe they would be uh, some balm uh, from Gilead, uh, 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 Lord, uh, some, some salve that will heal some wounds, maybe some things, Father, that would just be an encouragement and a help to us as uh, we navigate through this thing that we call life and as we face the trials and the storms that we are so often faced with. Again, we thank you for being a great God. Thank you for being holy, 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 for being mighty, and Lord, for watching over and taking care of us. And we just pray now all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, that's your adversary, we know that. But he has, he's as a roaring lion, and he walketh about seeking whom he, he may devour. Now, I got to looking at that uh, passage of Scripture there in uh, the Greek a little bit, and I got to thinking about it, and I got to, to just studying and doing some studying, and I'm thinking. I'm thinking that, that maybe the Greek word for lion doesn't really mean lion. I'm thinking maybe it means something like that. <laughs> I get it. That's not a lion, but it was kind of an interesting uh, uh, graphic. And brethren, it, picks, it depicts exactly what the devil would like to do to you. Amen? It, it reminds us that the devil is a roaring lion and that the devil does walk around uh, this earth, walk around your house, my house, everybody's neighborhood, in everyone's town, in everyone's state, in everyone's country, and the devil walks around and looks and sees, where is there somebody that I can devour? And he's constantly vigilant, constantly on alert, looking around for someone that he can devour. And that is why the Bible told us that thing, and that is why we have to operate with that in mind. So I titled this sermon here this morning, The Devil Wants to Devour. 
Amen? Uh, something that we know very well, but the devil wants to devour. And you know, the devil doesn't really care what method he will use to devour you. Amen. He's got lots of tricks up his sleeves. I just listed a few of them here, and it was very easy to come up with a lot. I listed, uh, he will devour you with family. He will devour you with your friends. He'll devour you with fear. He will devour you with folly. He will devour, devour you because of your finances. He will devour you because of your fellowship. He will devour you when you get to a place of frustration. He'll devour you when you get to a place where you've been forsaken. You noticed that was very illiterate of me. Or very, yeah. <laughs> right? I can't read, so I just had to use the same words in the dictionary under the letter F. <laughs> but, um, but the devil doesn't care, folks. I could have went on and on and on, but I ran out of Fs. No. <laughs> The devil, goes, the devil doesn't care what he has to use in your life to devour you. It can be something simple. It can be something complicated. It can be something small. It can be something large. The devil, the devil in your life, quite frankly, is simply a ticking time bomb, and you have to be ever vigilant and ever aware that he is there. Amen? Amen. And I know we, we talk about that, and yes, I know Brother Sean just made reference to Halloween, and the best part about Halloween is A, it's over, but B, uh, you know, they have the candy on sale afterwards. <laughs> right? Yes, yeah, 75%. See, he even knows how much the percentage discount is right now. So that's, uh, I, I love it. <clears throat> but the devil, the devil walks around seeking whom he, he may devour, and brethren, uh, He'll use anything that he can use. That time bomb is just waiting to go off in your life and destroy your household. Destroy everything that you've worked to become, everything that you've worked or you're striving to become. Right? The devil's a roaring lion. He walketh about seeking whom he, he may devour. And let me tell you something, brethren. He is very good at it. All right? He is very good at it. And I know we've talked about this before, but every once in a while, we just need to take a moment back and, and just reevaluate and remind ourselves who our enemy really is and what it is we're really fighting. Amen? Amen. The devil wants to devour. He wants to devour. He wants to devour you with destruction like you've never felt before. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Job chapter 1. Job's a phenomenal book in your Bible. And I, uh, every time I start getting down, every time I start struggling, I go back to the book of Job and I do some reading. And I read through and I, I am reminded of what Job had to go through. There's a lot of things in the book of Job. Uh, there's all kinds of types with uh, the tribulation and there's 42 chapters and there's 42 months in the second half of the tribulation and uh, there's, you know, the captivity of Job being turned. There's all kinds of, of references, but there's some very practical things in the book of Job. And I look at chapter 1, and it says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He had ten children. His substance also, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. We're not talking your typical peasant here. Brethren, we're talking, the, according to the Bible, one of the greatest men of his time. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every, uh, every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so that when the days of their, fast, uh, their feastings were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered a burnt offering according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed gods in their heart. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also. That is the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And, he's, and Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Satan said to the Lord that, that day, that fateful day for Job, he said, 
you know, I've just been wandering around this planet down here we call Earth, looking at people, and I'm checking to see who I can get. I'm, I'm, I've, been in the, I've been in the world, I'm, I'm looking around, and he says, I'm just looking who I can devour. And of course, we know that it's the Lord that brings up Job in this whole conversation. Right? We're well familiar with the story. And the Lord said unto Satan, you know, whence comest thou in verse 7 and verse 8, the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, All that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when the sons, um, when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the, and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another, also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I am only... I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, worshipped, and said, Naked came I, out, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Brethren, Job was a good man, according to God. Job was a good man, and Job, Job, had, to face, Job had to face destruction in his life like you and I have never had to face. Amen? Amen? I mean, something goes wrong for us. We get a flat tire, and if we're not careful, we start thinking that we're being persecuted, and God's against us, and God's out to kill us because the tire went flat. Well, maybe the tire went flat to keep you from driving into the accident that was going to happen a half a mile down the road from where you're at. Amen. Amen. And I know we know these things, but, but the, the truth of the matter is the devil goes about, and he is walking about this earth. He is the God of this world, and he's walking about this earth. And brethren, he's just looking for an opportunity to get to you. He's seeking whom he may devour. And sometimes destruction comes our way. Things don't happen well in our life. Sometimes our plans fall apart. Sometimes we get to questioning why God is doing the things that he's doing. And we get to looking at the whole scenario. And it just seems like our whole world is caving in around us. Sometimes we start to doubt the mercies of God. We start to doubt the love of God. We wonder, we wonder why God is doing what he's doing. Sometimes in the back of our mind, we have a tendency to challenge God's plans for us. We have a tendency to complain about God's provisions for us. We're human. We have a tendency to criticize God's protection. Why didn't he just keep me from falling? Why didn't he do that for me? Why didn't he take care of me better? It's just human nature. Brethren, I'm here to tell you this morning, that is the devil trying to devour you. Amen? And one of the first tactics that he used on Job, one of the first tactics he used was to de destroy some things that were around him. 
involving his property and quite frankly involving his family. The devil, the devil is out to destroy. We have to remember that. We have to remember when things start going awry and, and plans start falling apart and circumstances start tumbling downhill and we, wound up, we wind up looking at our, our situation and we see destruction like that building. I remember back in 95, um, I took a trip to China and we were walking around, I think it was Beijing, it was, maybe it was Xi'an, one of the big cities that we were in and I looked over, just very briefly, we're in a, a, a bus, and I looked out the window, and there was this building, this high building structure with, I guess you could call it, call it scaffolding, it was bamboo, but we would, it was scaffolding, it was designed for people to stand on, and I looked up there, and it looked kind of something like that, and I couldn't tell whether they were tearing that building down or building that building up. I couldn't tell what was going on with that building when I first looked at it. You know, now that I think about it more, I'm thinking, well, they probably were building it because normally they would have just taken a wrecking ball, I'm assuming, and just trashed it if, if they were taking it down. But when I first glanced on it, the thought that ran through my mind was that thing is in such disarray and such disorder and, and such a state that I cannot even tell if it's being built up or torn down. Sometimes that's how we are in the Christian life. Somebody looks at us from the outside, and you know what they can't tell? They can't tell if we're being built up or torn down. Amen? Amen? Sometimes, sometimes we, you know, we look at ourselves, and we think the same things. God, are you building me up, or are you tearing me down? Sometimes it's hard to distinguish. It really is. I mean, Job was a phenomenal gentleman. We all know that. We know the story. And, you know, we'll, we'll hit parts of it for uh, the sake of, of uh, trying to be brief this morning. I won't read the whole thing. But, but Job had to go through some real trials and real looks at, at himself. And Job thought he was in the midst of destruction. And at some level, he was. But it was the devil trying to do the destruction, not God. Amen. Amen? That's what you have to remember. The devil is the roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is the one that wanted to devour Job. The devil is the one that, that threw the challenge out and said, yeah, well, you're just protecting him. That's, that's why he's doing as, as well as he's doing. God knew Job's integrity was going to hold fast. That's quite the thing to say. None of us would say, I could do as well as Job did. I don't think I could. All right? But God knew Job could. And God did not give Job more than he was able to handle. Although for a while, it looked like some pretty massive destruction was going on. Amen? Amen. Listen. The devil will throw destruction in your life because he wants to shake your belief in how God operates. He wants, he wants to throw things in your life to make you doubt God's plan. To make you doubt whether God is really going to take care of you or not. Whether he really loves you or not. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. God's plans for you and I are so different than what we may see on the outside or what you may see in somebody else when you first look at their life. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, the Bible says in Luke, but to save them. Brethren, the Lord our God is a gracious God. He's holy. Amen. He's holy, but he, has, he does have your best interests at heart and listen when you don't have answers to why God is doing what he's doing there's some more dangers that creep into play Job sitting out there and you know the story he went out outside the city and he's sitting down and <clears throat> and of course the devil comes back and him and God have another exchange and God says okay you can touch his body but don't touch his life the devil goes back at Job a second time because this first destruction wasn't enough. 
And the devil decided to, to destroy Job some more and put boils all over his body. Next thing you know, Job's out there alone by himself for scraping the boils off with a broken pieces of, of uh, pottery. And he's just, he's just trying to maintain the wounds and just trying to survive. And you know what had to be going through his mind. Why? What did I do wrong? But he hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't done anything wrong. His enemy was not God. His enemy was not even himself. And I know sometimes we're our own worst enemy. I understand that. But sometimes it's not us. Sometimes it's a devil trying to destroy because that's what he does. That's what he does. He'll use anything that he can, but that is what he does. And the problem, the problem that Job uh, brings to light and that we see through this process of the devil destroy, trying to, to destroy Job is we see that he'll start off and he'll destroy everything around you. And you'll get to that place where Job got, and you'll be sitting out there and you'll be wondering why. And if you don't have any answers, if you can't rationalize what's going on, there's another step that takes place in the process of the devil devouring you. And that is this. Look at Job 3. Job chapter 3. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. This is where that destruction got Job. The devil started off just trying to destroy some things around him, and he did a pretty good job of it too. Everything. Job's trying to figure out why. Job can't figure out why. Job's not in on what just happened in chapter 1 that you and I can so easily read and see. Job's not aware of that. Job doesn't know that Satan's up there battling back and forth with God, and he's the one caught in the middle. Job just knows, I just lost 10 children. I just lost all my possessions. My wife is now nagging me to curse God and die. What is going on? And we'll talk about Job's friends. They come up, and you know they don't help him an awful lot either. Job opened his mouth in verse 1, and, Kurt, and, and uh, Job... After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night which it was said, There's a man child conceived. All right? Verse 8 Let them curse it and curse the day who are ready to raise up their mornings. Verse 11 Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why do the knees prevent me, or why the breasts that I should give suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept, then I had been at rest. Verse 20, wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, verse 21 and dig for it more than for hid treasures. Verse 20 and 21, Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul, which long for death, and dig for it more than hid treasures. Job faced that battle of depression. Job is down in the pits of despair right now. And it's the devil. It's the devil trying to devour Job. He's got a fight going on with God. He's got this little challenge going on with God, I understand. But Job is caught in the middle and the devil is trying his best to devour. Turn, if you will, with me to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 real quick. Keep your hand in, in Job. We'll be going back there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
2 Corinthians chapter 2. And when you look through 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we've talked a little bit about this on Wednesday evenings, but um, so there's this guy in the Corinthian church that had committed some grievous sin and, and uh, they had had to take some action against him. And now he had gotten some things right. And it's in the context here of restoring this man back into fellowship. And in verse 6, it says, Sufficient unto such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, um, so that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that you might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. For to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. Uh, for if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. And then it says this, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. And that's in the context, brethren, of some of the things that Satan uses to destroy a man. And Paul said up there back in verse 7, at the end of verse 7, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He said, listen, you got this guy in, in uh, your congregation. He's been dealt with. They, you know what? He, we took care of the sin and everything is fine. But I want you to be, I want you to be aware because if you're not careful with this, with this guy here, he's going to be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He's in such a pit of despair. He's on the verge. He's, he's where Job's at. And we all get there once in a while. Every single one of us face that once in a while in life. We get to that place where we, we see that destruction. The devil is, is thrown our way, and we don't understand it, and we're not sure why, and we, we bang our head against the wall, metaphorically speaking. I hope you don't really do that. Uh, bang our head against the wall, just trying to, trying to figure out, okay, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why? And if we're not careful, it leads us to a place where Job wound up. A great man better than you and I. Amen. And he wound up there. And he said, I wish I was dead. I wish I was never born. Curse the day that I was born. I wish something would have happened and I would have never even come into this world. And he, he longed for death. Your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he tried to devour Job. And it started off by some destruction with some things around him. And it, it led to a state where Job was depressed. I mean, he was, he was swallowed up. Right? Job was at this place in his life where nothing was going right, nothing was, nothing was happening. He couldn't understand what God was doing. He didn't see. He, I, I bet he began to doubt whether God even cared. Man, everybody goes through that at one point in time or another. You know what we worry about? We... We worry and we get to thinking that somehow or another God's forgiveness is insufficient for us. Because, you know, I've messed up too much. How many of you, I, you know, I don't need a show of hands, because I know every one of you would raise your hand. How many of you would, had that happen to you before? Amen. Oh, God can never forgive me for that. We get to thinking that God, the fellowship with God is, is, is inaccessible. There's no way I can be around God or God's people or God's place. I'm just so bad. There's just no way I can have fellowship with God anymore. I should, I should just stay back here in the, in the trash heap, scrape my wounds, and just die. We get to thinking somehow or another God's faithfulness is inapplicable to us. I mean, he's faithful to everybody else, but not me because... Why? Because the devil's trying to devour you. Amen. And he's got your mind all messed up because of the destruction, because of the depression. Listen, people go through that. It's, it's a real thing. 
Can I just refer you back to Job real quick? And again, I don't have time to read all of it, but you know how the thing turns out. I would just like to say this. Job did not get yelled at by God in the last few couple chapters of, uh, of the book because he got depressed. Think about that for a minute. God did not go to Job after this whole thing was over and say to him, how dare you? You fell into the pits of depression. I'm so disappointed. God did not say that to Job. Amen. God did not criticize Job for what Job went through. Amen? That's not what Job got in trouble for. That's something to think about. In fact, take a look at uh, verse chapter 38-ish of Job. Chapter, 30 out, chapter 38, the, um, the Lord finally, Elihu's finished speaking, who winds up being a pretty good fellow, but uh, chapter 38, the Lord finally chimes in and he says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer, and answer thou me. And he goes on, he asks Job all kinds of questions, Right? Um, and he goes and just asks Job over and over and over, and I'll, for, for brevity, I'll get to the end of it. Um, take a look at, take a look at Job, Job verse, chapter 40, verse 2, and here's the crux of the whole thing. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, so the Job, Job or the Lord is continuing, <laughs> right? Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, shall he that contendeth with the Almighty, instruct him? <laughs> he that reproveth God, let him answer it. You know, all this stuff that Job went through, getting to the place where, brethren, he just wanted to sit back in that trash heap back there and just die. And the Lord didn't yell at him for that. The Lord did not find fault with the fact that Job had a rough time when he went through these trials. The Lord found fault in Job because Job kind of thought he knew better than God did. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right? Job kind of got to the place where his pride got lifted up a little bit, and, and Job got to thinking there for just a split second that, you know, he could tell God a thing or two. And the Lord said, whoa, time, okay, now you've crossed the line, you can't go... He didn't yell at him because of how he endured the destruction and the depression. He endured it well. Was it tough on him? Yes, it was. But he endured it. The Lord, the Lord dealt with Job because he got a little haughty in the end. So here you have the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And you or I are on his list. And sometimes the devil is going to try to devour you with some destruction in things in your life. He doesn't care what he uses, but he'll do some destroying. And you'll look at some things and you won't understand why it's going on. And brethren, you will be tempted to question God. You'll be tempted to go down that, that same path Job went down. And that leads to a place of, of depression. Job got there, got there in chapter 3 and he said, I mean, curse the day that I was born. I wish I was never even born. And he goes on and on and on and on. And, and Job is understandably depressed and the Lord doesn't yell at him for it that's a wild thing see all too often we think when we get down in the dumps like that or when we're in that place we think there must be something wrong I think 
that's a natural human emotion that you're going to go through when things happen. I don't know of any way to escape it. Well, praise the Lord, I just lost 10 children. How do you escape that? That's unrealistic. Right? I think the Lord knew exactly what Job was going to go through. I think the Lord knew the depths to which Job was going to have to sink and struggle in this challenge that he had going on. But the Lord also knew deep down inside, I've given Job something down in, inside of him that will sustain him through it all. And it did. And the Lord did not get upset with Job for being in the pits of despair. Amen? 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 Now, when Job got a little haughty and thought he could tell God a thing or two, that's another story. <laughs> okay? Anyway, that pride thing will get, get, us, get the best of us. So the devil will come after you, and he'll try to get you just by destroying things in your life. Either you physically or things around you, people that you care about, things that you have. He'll, he'll try to get you off kilter to devour you by destruction. If that doesn't work, he'll take you to a place where depression sets in. And he'll try to, he'll try to devour you with depression. Right? That's what Job went through. Let's go back to Job chapter 11. And there's another thing that the devil will try to throw at you in the midst of all this. The devil will try to devour you for the sake of deeds. I've used doctrine. Amen. He will try to get you to get your thinking wrong about how God operates, about what God's doing, about how God is in control. Listen, and, uh, Zophar, one of the three friends of Job, pops up in Job chapter 11. Then answered Zophar, the uh, Namathite, and said, should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy lies, he's talking to Job, make men hold their peace? And when thou, uh, when thou mockest, should no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, and he's addressing Job, thou hast said, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. Job faced the destruction, and then he faced that depression, that despair, that despondency of, of just everything is falling apart, and he just wanted to crawl in a hole and die. Then his friends start talking, and you know what they bring up? They start bringing up doctrine. Oh, Job, you think you're right. You think your Bible view is right, and everybody else's is wrong. You think your doctrine is pure. And, and Zophar starts hammering Job on, on this doctrine thing. And he says, um, should, the, should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy lies make men hold their peace? For thou hast said, my doctrine is pure, verse 4, and I am clean in thy eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, and that he would show thee the, the secrets of wisdom, that they are uh, double to that which, that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thy iniquity, iniquity deserveth. Let me ask you this. Was that statement true? Does God require of us what we really should be paying as far as punishment? No. Canst thou by, by searching find out God? Well, can you? This is what Zophar is asking Job. Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Well, can you? It is as high as the heavens. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth, broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gathered together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men. He seeketh wickedness also, or seeth wickedness also. He will not cons uh, 
Will he not consider it? All those things are true. Interesting. Zophar starts using an, a doctrinal argument against Job that's got some truth in it. The devil will try to, to devour you by destroying things in your life, whatever that is. If that doesn't work, he'll throw you into a fit of depression. He'll knock you down, and you'll be down there with Job, and that depression does a lot of men in, and women. If that doesn't work, he'll start attacking the way you think about God, your doctrine. Zophar is hammering Job on what Job thinks God is doing. Right? Let me give you a, an example. Um, what is, the for the love of money is what? The root of all evil. evil. Everyone knows that, right? Amen. So is money a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, okay, the love of money is a, is a bad thing, right? And then, and then the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Now that's a true statement. We gotta be careful with that. I've known people that have read that verse, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. The love of money is the root of all evil. And they start combining the two. Oh, money's bad. EJ. Maybe I've told you about EJ before. Every time we see a black helicopter flying around, I think of EJ. Because EJ, because money was filthy lucre, and the love of money is the root of all evil, EJ had in his mind, I can have nothing to do with it. Which doesn't really work very well in our society. So he refused to use currency. He bartered. He would have silver, and he would... And he rode around on a bicycle because he didn't want to set any wicked thing before his eye, his eye and money was wicked. And it sounds really good, kind of. If you're EJ. <laughs> Listen, I remember, I remember when uh, the devil tempted the Lord 40 days in the wilderness. What does he say? Throw yourself off the pinnacle and the angels will take charge over thee and catch thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Well, that was true. That statement is true. It's Bible. Right? The devil used Bible against God when he was trying to get him messed up. The devil used Bible against people when he tries to get them messed up. I'll, I'll give you another one. Right? Women should be keepers at home. Oh, man, I've seen that blown up into all kinds of crazy proportions. The devil uses a, a, a hint of truth, a truth principle, and misapplies it. Why? Because he's trying to devour you. He's got Zophar, um, you know, hollering at Job, and Zophar says some things that are, have got some merit to them. In the end... God told uh, Job's three friends, you better have Job pray for you because you three really messed up. Amen. And they used some things that had an element of truth in them. You see, the devil doesn't care if he, has, if he devours you with destruction and tearing your, your world down or if he devours you when you get into that place of, of dis despair and depression and if those two things don't work, listen, he'll move on down to the third line and he'll try to mess you up with some doctrinal stuff. He'll get you thinking really weird about some of the things the Bible says. All right? I mean, we, you know, we laugh at this example. It's very common, everything. Let him that stole steal no more. So if I stole 100 grand last year, I can't exceed that amount this year. <laughs> All right? The devil, the devil will take a truth, a biblical truth, a principle, because you know the Bible. And he will throw it at you and try to get you messed up and make you doubt what God's really doing using a half-truth in Scripture 
or a true principle that's misapplied in Scripture. So you got these three friends of, of Job, and it's got nothing at all to do with Job doing anything wrong. It's a battle way above his pay grade. And these three friends are sitting down there using biblical principles and precepts, doctrine, if you will, to try to tell Job what's wrong with him. And there's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> I mean, there's something wrong with it. He's a little pr proud, heady. You know, he, he, he questions God a little bit too much. But God deals with Job on that directly. All right? Listen, the devil... The devil will hold this little carrot out in front of you. And let me tell you something. When things around you have been destroyed, and when you're sitting down there in the depths of depression, and you're looking for something to cling to and grab a hold of for help, the devil will dangle that Bible carrot out there in front of you. True. Just like he did Job. Amen. What was he? He was trying to get Job all twisted up in his head so Job would get mad at God and, and curse God. That was the whole point of the exercise between the devil and God, right? Amen. So the devil will use Bible and Bible principles to mess you up. He's done it from day one. Amen. What does he say to Eve in the garden? Ha! Yea, hath God said. The first thing that he does with Eve to mess her up is he starts bringing up, well, didn't God say this? Well, how about it, Eve? Right? The devil is a roaring lying, lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. You got this spiritual battle going on between the devil and the Lord. The devil's moving up and down in the world, walking to and fro in it, and he presents himself when the Son of God's come to present themselves before God. The devil shows up, and now you got this battle between God and the devil going on, and Job gets brought into it. The original battle wasn't even about Job. God brought Job into it. The devil just is, was doing what he does. And so the devils sought to devour Job by destroying everything around him, by taking him to that place of despair and, and depression, despondency, where, where he just, Job just wanted it all to end. And when that didn't work, he brought his three friends there and they started having scriptural discussions about how God operated. Let me tell you something. When you're in the pits of depression, it's not a really good time, okay? It's not a really good time to argue Bible principles because the devil is right there dangling that carrot in front of your face and he'll, he wants you to grab it, latch on some, to something and head off in the wrong direction. Amen. Why? Because he's only after... To devour you. That's all he's cares about. That's all he's worried about. And unfortunately, because we're in that state where things have been destroyed, now we're depressed, we're not thinking right. And it's easy for the devil to trick us up in doctrine. Job didn't fall for it. All right? Job didn't fall for it. Job, in uh, chapter 12, verse 9, said, Who knoweth not in all these things that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? He said, You know what? I don't care how bad things have gotten. I know God's in charge. Amen. God is in control. I don't care what I've gone through. I don't care what I've been through. I know God is in control. And ultimately, it's him I've got to rely on. Amen. 
to get me out of this. The devil will try to make you think God did something that God didn't do. The devil did it. It's not God who's trying to destroy Job. It's not God who's trying to devour Job. It's the devil. And all Job had to do was hold fast his integrity, and God wins. All right? Hold fast his integrity, and God wins. Listen. The devil wants to devour you. And brethren, each and every one of you goes through that at one level or maybe even multiple times throughout the course of your life. And you're going to have to remember the book of Job. And you're going to have to make yourself familiar with it. Because in it, you'll find the answers. You'll see in spite of everything that Job went through, which A, you'll be able to look at it and say, at least it's not that bad for me. Amen. <laughs> okay? I mean, right off the bat, whoa, at least, at least it's not that bad for me. Amen. And B, you'll be able to see how God took Job through that thing. And yeah, God had to have a little heart-to-heart -heart with Job about his attitude, which we fail at that too. But in the end... God tells Job, tells Job's three friends, you better hope that Job prays for you because if you don't, <laughs> you're in trouble. Amen. Job was the one that God held up in spite of his, you know, uh, in, in spite of his mistakes there with questioning what God was doing. And his, his pride crept into to things a little bit. But God held Job up and provided for him and protected him through it all. And in the end, we know the story how it ends. In the end, God gave Job 10 times more than he had originally. All right? Forty. I'm thinking of Daniel. <laughs> he gave he gave Job more than he had. In the end, God took care of Job. Blessed him more than his latter end. Verse twelve, chapter forty two, verse twelve. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 she-asses, also seven sons and three daughters. In the end, God took care of it all. But brethren, I watch, and I see not just, in, not just here in this church, but it's happening all over Amen. with Christians. Amen. We see the devil trying to devour. That's what he does. And those are the steps he took Job through to devour him. And they look really familiar because I see him repeated time and time and time again. And I'd just like to say this morning, the Lord saw Job through that whole thing. What an amazing thing that is. You say it wasn't fair. If you're born again here this morning, if you're saved, you get up to heaven, you talk to Job now, and you look at how many millions of people were sustained because of what Job had to go through. Amen. When the Lord sits back and rewards Job and says, buddy, you have done an amazing thing. Your life, your suffering, your destruction that you had to go through, your depression that you had to go through influenced millions of my children. And you got them through the darkest hours in their life. You asked Job if it was worth it now. 
and he'll tell you something completely different than he told you in chapter 3. Amen. See, in chapter 3, now for now we see through a glass darkly. We don't see it all. But then face to face. Amen? Amen? So when you're going through this process, brethren, remember the light at the end of the tunnel. Remember where God's taking you. Remember how God got Job through. And don't ever doubt that he'll do the same for you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. Listen, the Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. We all have to go through that steps, but we don't have to stay there. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you here this morning once again for, for the Bible for raising up men like Job, Father, a far greater man than myself. But Lord, I thank, I thank you for allowing him to go through that struggle. I thank you for allowing him to go through those trials. And Lord, as hard as it must have been on Job, I know this, I know every time I go back to that book, Father, it is an encouragement and a help to me. And it's gotten me through some dark hours down here in this earth. Lord, one of these days, I would like to be able to stand and shake Job's hand and say thank you for being a help to me in my Christian walk. Oh, Lord, everybody goes through that same process. I'm sure there are folks here this morning that are going through it or in the middle of it. I do pray that you would encourage them, that you would give them some insight, that you would help them to realize that you can take them through just like you took Job through just like you've taken countless millions of Christians through over the years. Father, that you're faithful, you're true, you're good. And Lord, we can rely on you. So I pray if there's anybody here this morning who is going through that type of thing, that you would encourage their hearts, you would lift them up, and give them, Father, the end of the story to think about. Help them to remember the end. You put it in the book for us to see, there's nothing wrong with us turning to the last chapter and finding out how things turn out. And Lord, in this case, that is a, um, a fresh drink of water from a cold spring. And I thank you for that. Pray that you'd help us here this morning. Help us what we're struggling with and going through. And give us a, a vision, Father, for how the book ends. Not the turmoil in the middle. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.